So it's, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Chris Quigg uh, from Fermilab. In fact, he's in the uh, theoretical physics department at, at Fermilab. Chris got his PhD at Berkeley on the West Coast, went to the East Coast uh, at Stony Brook, and then uh, in 1974 came back into the middle here in, at, at Fermi, and has been at Fermi ever since, um, working on a wide variety of things. And I think um, he's been recognized by uh, a large group of organizations. Um, he's been on a lot of different committees and program reviews and government advisory boards and the panels for the National Academy of Science and the National Research Council. He's a fellow of the American Society and the AAC, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 2011, he was the co-recipient of the J.J. So Sakurai Prize of the uh, APS for his contributions to chart a course for the exploration of TEV scale physics with Hadron Colliders. So you can see he's been involved uh, basically his entire career with high energy physics, uh, plotting the future and, and, and other things. And today he's going to tell us about the, the Higgs boson. Chris. Thanks very much. So thank you for the kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming here. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about um, the theoretical ideas that led to the notion of the Higgs boson, and to talk a little bit about what happens now that our colleagues working at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN have found the uh, Higgs boson. And what I want to do is to uh, try to show how a number of different lines of thought that are common throughout physics have come together to help us build the theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions, to understand how the electroweak symmetry is hidden, and to see the implication of the Higgs boson. And so I'll try to trace uh, some of the themes from different kinds of physics that came together in this, uh, this construction of the the electroweak theory, or as we call it, the standard model of particle physics. I begin with the notion of symmetry, which is uh, essential in all of physics, not just in um, writing solutions to homework problems when you're an undergraduate. Symmetry has a couple of meanings. One of them is uh, that an object or a law of nature, an equation, is the same in appearance before and after some transformation. So it's indistinguishable before and after a transformation. This means in the experimental settings that some quantities are unobservable. In the presence of the symmetry, some correlations that might more generally be present are absent, and so there's, some, there's nothing to measure. There's a quantity that will vanish if the symmetry holds. And finally, and this is a little hard for those of us who grew up exposed to Western ideas of uh, decoration and uh, artistic endeavor to, to, uh, to realize is that symmetry corresponds to disorder. The more disordered a system, the more symmetrical it has. Whereas the notions that we have in Western decoration of symmetry often mean that very simple symmetries that are not terribly general uh, are taught to us as symmetry. So we'll look at a, a few examples of that. One of the heroes of the introduction of symmetry into um, physics was Hermann Weyl. Uh, and in particular, he'll play a part in our, our invention of the theories that lead us to the uh, electroweak theory. At the time that he was re retiring from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, he gave a series of lectures and wrote a charming little book called Symmetry, in which he had identified as interesting for his lecture audience four kinds of symmetry bilateral symmetries, translational and rotational symmetries, ornamental symmetries, and the regularity seen in crystals. And I'll show you examples of those immediately. What's a little funny and strange about uh, Weil's swan song in, the, in this book is that his greatest contributions, at least for us in particle physics, had to do with continuous symmetries, and he doesn't mention those at all in the book, but only the discrete symmetries. Maybe a second volume was planned, I don't know. So here are examples of some of the kinds of symmetry. Here's uh, an object which I think doesn't exist in nature, at least not so far as I know, uh, but it exhibits bilateral symmetry. 
It actually is in Middle Eastern cultures something called the Hamsa, which is a talisman against evil and danger. So whether or not it exists in nature, it exists in uh, decoration. So that's bilateral symmetry. Here's an example of translational symmetry. You can see this, this marble lintel looks the same if you shift it by a certain amount in uh, the, the lateral direction. Uh, here's an example of rotational symmetries. This is a buckyball uh, C60, which has different axes through the center about which you can turn it by different amounts, say uh, one-sixth of, of a rotation, one-fifth of a rotation, and all of those leave this, the form of the object invariant and make it look the same as it did when it started. In uh, Islamic cultures in particular, there's a very highly developed set of symmetries. If you go to the Alhambra in Granada, you can find with a keen eye all of the uh, 18 or so uh, translation, rotation, shift groups that are known to mathematicians in the decorations on the buildings. And there's an example of that. And finally, here's an example of the crystal symmetry that, uh, that Vial mentioned. As I said, it's a little odd that are incongruous that he didn't mention in his book continuous symmetries, but those are of great importance to us. Uh, here's an example of a perfect sort of object, a sphere. Uh, in contrast to the buckyball, bucky where we had to pick a finite set of axes about which to make rotations by specific amounts, any diameter through the sphere rotated by any amount leaves it looking the same, and so it has a much higher degree of symmetry than the buckyball does. And an example of uh, perfect translational symmetry, not just chunking along by a certain amount, but going by any amount, uh, you see in the middle of a cloud where you can't tell where you are, at least down to a certain resolution, everything looks the same. You can move by an arbitrary amount or look in a di different direction, rotate by a different direction, and things will look the same. This is an example of a uh, very intricate ornamental symmetry in the Ludwigskirche in uh, Munich. And you can see, if you look at this uh, study in detail, that there are elements like the continuous bands of color, red or blue, which, again, are continuous symmetries. You can rotate about the center by any amount, and those, look, those elements look the same. And then there are others that you will recognize here where you have to make rotations by a specific finite amount, uh, there are some 16-fold symmetries, 32-fold symmetries, 8-fold symmetries, 64-fold symmetries. Uh, sometimes I give this picture to beginning students or members of the public as a homework exercise to try to understand how many different uh, symmetries you can find in the different elements of this. Now, symmetry matters. It's not only for decoration. And to show you that symmetry matters, I need a volunteer from the audience. And I see Rick Yoshida has volunteered. So if you come up here. It's not often the theorists get to use apparatus, so I take every opportunity. So here is a standard aluminum can. And I can ask you how much this holds. 12 ounces, well, it's 12 ounces, but it's also about 100 kilograms. And we're gonna demonstrate that it holds 100 kilograms. So what I'd like you to do is to use the podium to steady, steady yourself, to stand on that as uh, evenly as you can, and we will see that with even pressure on it, it supports you, not to say that you weigh 100 kilograms. <laughs> the essence of doing experiments is to have spares. So try again. So there he is, it's supporting his weight, which is rather remarkable. And now that he's perfected his technique, we'll change to the gold can. I love it, just a second. I love it when the result of an experiment is, if it had worked, this is what would have happened. So don't feel the pressure, but you gotta get this right. <laughs> okay, so what would have happened had these not been inferior cans? You told me you were nimble, but 
<laughs> I didn't say I was, I was light. <laughs> You're certainly light. <laughs> so you can do this one at home. It's safe to, <laughs> safe to do at home. Is that it will, these cans will support up to about 100 kilos if you stand on them in, in, with uh, even distribution of your weight. And you can actually stand there for some time until you, you know, sitter bevegung takes, takes effect or something like that. But if you give the gentlest tap that you can imagine, that's why I brought my uh, weapon, my kitchen spoon, the gentlest tap you can imagine, the can will collapse because the symmetry that is preventing it from deciding which way to collapse will be broken. And if only we had practiced, uh, you would have seen that. I gave this talk once in Geneva when I was the person standing on the can. It took me six cans to get it to work. <laughs> so you're not the biggest loser. <laughs> okay, so symmetry is, is important. It would have, well, it did support Rick for a while. And had you seen him collapse, you would be convinced that broken symmetry is interesting because it makes things happen that wouldn't have happened while the symmetry was enforced. One of the reasons that symmetries are so important in our formulation of theories has to do with work early in the 20th century by Emmy Noether, who made the mathematical discovery that to every continuous symmetry of a Lagrangian or some other uh, incarnation of the laws of nature, there corresponds to a conservation law. And this is at the, uh, the heart of an important technique for making observations in nature. You may see a conservation law and try to imagine how to embody that in the laws of nature described by a Lagrangian or some other equation. And you will find that there's always a symmetry that stands in correspondence to that. One of the things that is hard about making up theories is that it's so easy to make up theories. And so any principle that you have that restricts the field of view to theories that might plausibly turn out to be right is very important and useful. And this kind of symmetry is such a principle. Uh, you know a lot of these, the conservation laws that are correspond to different, uh, different symmetry principles. The idea that the laws of nature are the same at all places, that you can spatially translate, gives rise to the conservation of momentum. Time, tra time translation is related to the conservation of energy. Rotation invariance is related to the conservation of angular momentum. So all of those are things that we can envisage in real space. There are also symmetries that occur in sort of psychic spaces, internal spaces. And the simplest of those is the notion that the quantum mechanical wave function has a phase, but that that phase is arbitrarily defined. We can, de we can detect interferences, so differences among phases, but an individual phase is the re result from, of an arbitrary, um, arbitrary convention for what is the, uh, the zero of phase. And formulated in the right way, that leads us to the conservation of additive, additive quantum numbers such as electric charge. And as we'll see, is a way of uh, generating from nothing or from one idea, the idea of quantum electrodynamics and the full content of um, Maxwell's equations. So that's one way in which we inspect the universe and uh, imagine symmetries that should be respected by the laws of nature. It's important to recognize, and this is uh, ubiquitous in all of physics, it's particularly prominent in condensed matter physics, but also in particle physics, that the symmetries that we see in the laws of nature or impose on the laws of nature don't guarantee that the outcome of those laws will reflect the same symmetries. So there are many examples of this. Uh, you know about the two-dimensional Ising model in which there is a completely unbiased uh, notion about the interaction between adjacent up and down spins, dipoles if you like, uh, but that, that can lead over time at low temperatures to the, uh, the development of domains of, of uh, one orientation or the other, or in fact to the whole sample flipping uh, in the nature of uh, ferromagnetism. Another that's uh, commonplace around here, another example of such a secret or hidden symmetry is the rotation invariance in quantum electrodynamics. You start with a drop of water, and at least in a gravity-free environment, it's spherical. It looks the same from every direction. You can turn it around and around. It always looks like the same spherical drop. But when uh, frozen under the right conditions, it leads to a configuration that we're taught to recognize as highly symmetrical, the beautiful, beautiful six-fold snowflake patterns. Uh, instead of having an infinite number of axes around which you can make the rotation, there's but a single axis. And instead of being able to rotate the sphere by 
any amount, you have to rotate by 60 degrees about the axis. So there is a symmetry that remains, but it's a hidden, the full, full symmetry, which is the three-dimensional rotation invariance of quantum electrodynamics, or electrodynamics, with, yeah, it really is quantum electrodynamics, that's holding the uh, molecules of, of water together and the snowflakes is hidden from us by the circumstances. The state of lowest energy happens to be one that doesn't demonstrate the, um, the full symmetry. So here's an example I like to give to uh, students at summer schools. It's, a, again, a, an experiment that you can do at home or at least talk about doing at home. You take a bottle of wine, and it turns out that it works better if it's a good bottle of wine because they tend to have a nice, uh, well-defined punt in the bottom. And if it's a perfect bottle of wine, of course, that will be perfectly symmetrical. The uh, part, the task left for the students is to, to decide how to empty the bottle of wine, but I leave that as an exercise for students. And then you imagine placing a perfectly spherical pearl here, and you wait to see what happens. Well, it's a situation of complete symmetry, the cylindrical symmetry around the, uh, the vertical axis. And so no direction should be preferred over any other. But we know that it won't sit there forever. It will finally fall off and go in one direction or another. Uh, it could be that there's a preferred direction, so it's necessary to do the experiment again. Turns out to be better with a new bottle of wine. And uh, if you do it again and again, you will, depending on how you emptied the bottle of wine, you will either conclude from the experiment or think you've concluded from the experiment that all directions are equally probable. And that's how we recover the notion of the symmetry that was present in the first place. So that is a famous example that we'll see involved in, uh, in particle physics and in condensed matter physics. The essential feature of these kinds of situations is that there's a continuum of degenerate vacua or states of lowest energy, the ones at the rim on the bottom, all at the same elevation. So here's a stylized example of uh, such an experiment. We start with a, a shape of that kind and put the perfect pearl there. And now let's think not in terms of something you do in your apartment or home uh, in which the the ball may drop because somebody walked across the floor or a truck went down, down the street, but a quantum uh, world. And in the quantum world, there's Zitterbewegung. We can't localize the pearl exactly at the symmetric point with no momentum, so it will start rattling around. And after a while, it will rattle so far that it falls off in some direction. So we do it again, and it goes off in some other direction and another direction and another direction. And again, if you were to carry out this experiment infinitely many times, you would find that the probability for every direction is, same, is the same, that which direction is chosen in a, different, in a particular example of the experiment is completely aleatory, random, and uh, that reflects the underlying symmetry of the situation, the cylindrical sy sy symmetry of the setup. The fact that we have a degenerate of, continu of, of uh, continua, of vacuum states, means that all of these states are states of the same energy, and so it costs no energy to transform from one to another. We can push in a perfect world, no friction. We can push the pearl around, and uh, everything will be the same. So this was an observation made for continuous symmetries in the early 1960s by Jeffrey Goldstone. Um, with work before and, and after by uh, Yachira Nambu, that if you have a continuous symmetry that is spontaneously broken, it results in a situation where there is a massless excitation. And these massless bosons, scalar particles in quantum field theory, are called now Nambu-Goldstone bosons. You see them as spin waves in uh, condensed matter physics and phono as phonons. Uh, one of the early applications by uh, Nambu and Yonelicinio was to identify this kind of symmetry breaking, a spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry in that case, as an argument for why the pion is so much less massive than the other particles like the proton, the other strongly interacting particles like the proton. And in fact, he accounted for the pion mass by having a little bit of explicit symmetry breaking as well. So there are Nambu and Goldstone. And in some settings in condensed matter physics, these are known as phase modes. This is the mechanical analog of what are called phase modes, following the work of Bogolyubov and Anderson 
and other people. Now, there's another mode, which is the one in which, instead of having a, a phase mode or a rotational mode, it's a radial mode in which you try to, to move the ball up and, up and down. There will always be a restoring force, and the nature of that restoring force uh, is characterized by the mass of the object that's related to the, the curvature of the, uh, the bottom of the, the well, uh, near the bottom of the, the potential well. And so this corresponds to a massive mode. It's a massive scalar boson in quantum field theory, and this is sometimes called an amplitude mode in the condensed matter setting. Now, it's interesting in retrospect that this is the thing that we can trace and which turns out to be, in the setting of our electroweak theory, what becomes the Higgs boson, the massive scalar particle, which is the footprint of the mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking. Goldstone didn't particularly remark on it at the time, and I think the reason was that he, he was comparing a situation which was, had a simple symmetry, uh, namely a wine glass shape in which there's a single minimum at the bottom. In that case, you have massive modes that go in the x direction and in the y direction, both. So you start with two massive modes, and then after you change to a situation in which the symmetry is spontaneously hidden, you have one massive mode left, but big deal, you had two to begin with. And the remarkable thing that he found was the existence of these new massless modes. Anyway, this is, is in the most primitive sense, the object that later becomes the Higgs boson of the standard model. So that's one idea, the notion of symmetry as a basis of uh, physical laws and the notion of hidden symmetries and the consequences of those hidden symmetries. Pursuing symmetries a little bit, we now turn to the interactions themselves. Uh, people in Chicago, at least until Target or somebody bought the building, used to know the Carson Peary Scott building, which was um, designed by Louis Sullivan, one of the great heroes of Chicago architecture, and whose credo was that form should follow function, that the use to which a building was going to be put should dictate how the building appeared and, and therefore the way that it would work. The first to reverse this idea in the setting of laws of, of uh, nature was Hermann Weyl, the uh, symmetry man, who started in uh, 1918 with the idea that it might be possible to make a unified theory of the two interactions that he knew about at that time namely electricity and magnetism, so electromagnetism on the one hand and gravity on the other hand. His first notion was that maybe you can make up a story in which the calibration of rulers, the scale, would change from place to place, and that if you impose the requirement that invariance under, under that symmetry be a characteristic of the laws of nature that you derive, that you could get both electricity and, and uh, electromagnetism and gravity out of it. It didn't work, it didn't work for an interesting reason that he hadn't reckoned with quantum mechanics for the good reason that quantum mechanics hadn't been invented yet. And so it took a while for people to invent quantum mechanics. And um, then for Weil and under the prod of other people to notice that that wasn't quite the right idea but that you could make a very great invention if in the light of quantum mechanics you would say that not only should the laws of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger equation or some Lagrangian you write down uh, for the Dirac equation or something like that, not only should they be invariant under global changes in the phase convention, but that they should be invariant under local changes in which every seat in the auditorium uh, adopts its own convention for zero phase. And from that, you can actually derive electromagnetism. So that was Weil's great insight, which took him a decade to come up with. So here's the idea. We're all trained by our parents and teachers to think that in a complex plane, something that points in this direction is real. But it could have happened that there was a conspiracy and they had trained us that something in that direction was real. And we know that for uh, expectation values in quantum mechanics, which are given by the uh, uh, integrand over the complex conjugate of a wave function times a Hermitian operator times the wave function itself, that if you change the, complex, the wave function by some amount, you change the complex conjugate by the other amount. So that's a symmetry. 
If we in try to in impose the stronger symmetry and say that at each place and time we can have a separate convention, if you write that down, it's three or four lines of arithmetic, you'll find that things like the Schrodinger equation, uh, observables involving things like momentum, don't satisfy that symmetry. And so you could either give up at that point or say, I wonder what would happen if I would change the laws of nature, the Lagrangian or the equation, in order to respect that symmetry. And what you find is that you can build a theory in which everywhere you replace the derivatives, the gradients or, or, COVID, or, um, or uh, four gradients by the four gradient plus or minus, depending on your convention, the electric charge times a three vector or four vector potential, which turns out to be the, four, the vector potential of electromagnetism. And by doing this, you actually recover the full content of Maxwell's equations and have a basis for deriving the theory of quantum electrodynamics. So that's not the way Maxwell made the argument. He didn't have quantum mechanics to, to rely on. But what you find by doing this is that there has to be a vector field. Uh, it will interact with the conserved current of the theory, in this case, the electric charge. And the carrier in quantum field theory of the force has to be a massive, mass, massless spin one particle, which we identify as the photon. So by, from this symmetry principle, you get the full content of quantum electrodynamics. In this case, there's no reason not to simply write down an electron mass to be whatever you want. And technically, the reason for that is that the left-handed and right-handed electrons, which have to come together to make a mass term, have the same electric charge, and so they have the same symmetry properties under this, this transformation. The next step took 25 years to be made. And this was made in the early 1950s by uh, Yang and Mills and by Shaw. At that time, the, the uh, new symmetry of isospin, or the charge symmetry of nuclear forces, the fact that forces involving protons, force and forces involving neutrons, when looked at, looked at the same way, uh, are the same, have the same strength, and that the proton and neutron could be taken approximately as two sides of the same particle they differ in charge, to be sure, but they have about the same mass. You could idealize that and think that they have the same mass and properties. And if you imagine a world in which you turn off electromagnetism, you could say that which one you call the proton and which one you call the neutron is purely a matter of convention. Well, you can write down such a, such a theory in which the convention is globally arbitrary. But their, their question was, could you write down a theory in which independently at every point in space and time, you choose a convention for which combination of your basis states is the proton and which is the neutron. And it turns out that's a little more complicated than the der derivation of quantum electrodynamics. Maybe it takes half a page or, or so, but you can carry out the arithmetic and in the same way, you find that you have to introduce a vector field. Uh, there are three massless gauge bosons that correspond to the three generators of the local isospin symmetry, the SU2. They couple to the conserved quantum number of the theory, isospin. And again, because the left-handed and right-handed protons and neutrons have the same transformation properties, you can just write down a theory in which you have the nucleon mass and set it to whatever you want. So this is great from the point of view of a mathematical accomplishment. You set yourself a homework problem. You can actually solve it. You can write down such a theory. It has interesting properties that, in contrast to electromagnetism, in which the photon doesn't interact directly with itself, because the photon couples to charge and the photon doesn't have, have any charge. In this case, the gauge bosons of the Yang-Mills theory do couple to each other because they carry the, the isospin charge of the, uh, of the basic symmetry. Well, it's a wonderful mathematical construction, but it's not a good theory of, uh, of the forces between nucleons because we know the long range force is pion exchange, so it's a light, uh, spin zero particle, and the repulsive forces that come from the uh, rho and omega exchange and things like that that are corresponding to spin one particles correspond to massive spin one particles. Our construction le leads to massless spin one particles. Well, could you hide the symmetry and would that help? What we've just seen from the example of Nambu and Goldstone and company is that if you were to start with a local symmetry and to, uh, or with a global symmetry and to break it, that you would get the massless gauge bosons, but also massless pseudoscalars, which 
unless you think the pion should be idealized a little more, doesn't correspond to what we see there. So it gets all the forces incorrect. At this period, people paid a lot of attention to such ideas. The yang mills theories were very popular because they were a uh, wonderful invention. But the Goldstone theorem was occupying and preoccupying people more and more, and it was proved, it was proved more better and better rigor. So people were sort of at a uh, uh, break point there in which it looked like this wasn't going anywhere. Nevertheless, lots of people tried to see whether it was possible to make a yang mills theory that correspond to massive quanta rather than massless quanta. Now to see how this came about and uh, what the clues were that led people to the, the right solution, and we have to look to another current in, in physics, and this goes back to the discovery of superconductivity by Heike Kamerling Onis in 1911. As you all know, the first miracle of superconductivity is that as you cool a substance below some critical temperature, the substance very abruptly snaps into a state of zero resistance, and so it's possible to carry electrical current without resistance. That was the, the um, discovery of Kamerling Onis. The second miracle, um, discovered much later in 1933 by Meissner and Oxenfeld, is the one that's the stuff of these sorts of demonstrations that people have used, especially in the wake of uh, the discovery of uh, high temperature superconductors. What we have here is a sample of high temperature superconductor, that's the black disc. It's immersed in liquid nitrogen to cool it below its critical temperature. And then you see a little magnet floating on the magnetic field that lines uh, above it. That reflects the fact that in a superconducting substance, the magnetic field lines penetrate only a tiny amount. They don't penetrate through the substance, and it's the expulsion of those magnetic field lines that gives rise to this cushion on which the, uh, the magnet floats and corresponds to the notion that within the superconducting substance, the photon, which after all is a force particle of a local gauge theory, quantum electrodynamics, the photon acquires a mass, and that mass is inversely related to the penetration depth of the uh, magnetic field into the substance. So that's a very significant clue that magnetic fields would be, could be excluded, and we still have the theory of quantum electrodynamics, but in the special circumstance of the interior of a superconductor, the photon acquires mass. One of the early descriptions of this is the phenomenological model of Ginsberg and Landau, they start with a uh, cartoon. The cartoon is that there are two kinds of charge carriers in a potentially superconducting material, the normal resistive charge carriers and the magic superconducting char charge carriers that carry current without resistance. And they imagine that above a, a critical temperature, if you sketch the free energy as a function of the order parameter which is related to, in some way, to the density of active superconducting charge carriers, it's monotonically increasing, so the state of lowest energy that corresponds to the vacuum state of the universe is the state in which there are no active superconducting charge carriers, so you have a normal substance. Then they imagine below the critical temperature that the shape of the free energy curve is not monotonically rising, but changes to this shape. And then you can see that the state of lowest energy is one in which some number of the uh, superconducting charge carriers are active. And this means that you'll be in the superconducting state. Well, at that level of detail, it's just a cartoon to tell you to repeat in pictures what you already knew in words, that you had resistance above a certain temperature and no resistance below a certain temperature. What's good about this, this model is that you can then generalize it to a slightly more complicated system in which there is an um, electromagnetic field present. And if you work that out, again, it's a few lines of work to see, you will find that you derive from the second picture the notion that the photon acquires a mass inside the superconductor that's a consequence of the non-zero expectation value of this order parameter. So that gives a way of seeing that. And when we explain to our students today how the Higgs mechanism comes about, how you motivate it, the simplest model that, that we use is just a uh, very trivial generalization of this. That seems not to have been the way it happened. Uh, back in the early 60s. So I'm here at Ginsburg and Landau. And I tease my colleague Bill Bardeen by saying that uh, 
there was this attractive nuisance around with the uh, Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer theory of superconductivity. It's a very deep theory, it's very uh, complicated to analyze. As you know, it gives rise to the notion that the uh, order parameter me measures the density of correlated electron pairs. And this was capturing the attention of all sorts of theorists in condensed matter physics and particle physics, nuclear physics, and so on. And the path by which the uh, perpetrators of the Higgs mechanism were led to their discovery was much more complicated than we now think it needed to be because they were fascinated by this theory. So it's an example of a great uh, breakthrough in understanding actually making people make a problem harder than it needed to be. So some hints came along the way. There was uh, early work in 1962 by Julian Schwinger who considered a special situation in one plus one dimensional quantum electrodynamics and showed that even the pres in the presence of a gauge symmetry, you could have a massive photon. Uh, so that was an example, but it wasn't in four dimensions. And then Phil Anderson in 1963 wrote a paper that is, uh, uh, has a lot of very suggestive comments in it. Uh, he noticed that in the superconductor, the uh, photon is massive, that the gauge symmetry is hidden, and he has this very cryptic statement that uh, maybe making a theory of the strong interactions, the nuclear forces, wouldn't be that hard because you had these two problems of zero mass particles, the scalars, the Goldstone bosons, and the massless gauge bosons, and maybe those problems would each eat themselves up. Um, so you know, that anticipates much of what we see in the Higgs mechanism, although it wasn't worked out in any details and certainly not in a relativistic theory. So the next year, uh, stimulated by various developments, uh, false steps here and there, uh, three different groups, six people, uh, had the insight that following the example of superconductivity in which a gauge theory, quantum electrodynamics, in special circumstances gives rise to massive force particles, you could accomplish that in the setting of a relativistic quantum field theory. The first thing that they, I mean, the most important insight that they had was that this theorem, the Goldstone theorem, proved again and again more and more rigorously, only applied to what I would somewhat cynically call uninteresting theories. You remember that when you learn to quantize uh, field theories, that in uh, the case of quantum electrodynamics, which at this period of uh, our history was regarded as the most successful theory, the most beautiful theory in which you could make uh, uh, extremely precise calculations and they agreed with experiment, that you had to do some little trick, that when you quantize quantum electrodynamics, you could either choose for it to be manifestly Lorentz invariant, or you could choose for it to be positive definite on the Hilbert space, have a positive definite metric on the Hilbert space, but not both. And the well-behaved theories for which the Goldstone theorem was proved were those that obeyed what were at that time called the usual axioms of axiomatic quantum field theory, and those excluded theories like quantum electrodynamics. So the basic insight of these six gentlemen, Peter Higgs, Tom Kibble, Jerry Gorelnik, uh, Carl Hagen, François Angler, and Robert Brout, was that quantum electrodynamics was not a theory to which the Goldstone theorem applied. So that meant the door was open for some miracle to happen. And what happens in uh, the way that was, you know, at least symbolically and maybe more anticipated by uh, Anderson was that each of the massless, would-be massless Nabu Goldstone bosons that correspond to a broken generator of the, the gauge symmetry becomes a third longitudinal component of the gauge bosons and gives them mass. So the problems do indeed eat each other up. The simplest example of this is something that we now call the Abelian-Higgs model, and it is precisely the, uh, the Ginsburg-Landau model written not in three-vector notation, but in four-vector notation. So if you steal from the right people, you don't have to do very much technically in order to make a nice discovery. And by this device, Higgs was able to show that in this theory, you do indeed get a massive photon in the relativistic setting, plus left over a massive scalar particle, which is the Higgs boson, and which is that object that we saw back in the original uh, original discussion of the, the Goldstone boson. 
Now, there was in the work of these people no mention of the weak interactions. People were attacking this problem either to try to make the Yang-Mills theory work for the strong interactions or just for the theoretical interest of seeing whether it was possible for a gauge theory to give you massive gauge particles. There was no question of fermion masses because in the setting they were thinking about, like electrodynamics or maybe, maybe the force between nucleons, again, the left-handed and right-handed particles transformed in the same way, and so there was no impediment to writing down a, uh, a mass term for the theory. So you sometimes see in the popular accounts of the uh, Higgs mechanism that Higgs or Higgs and Angler and Braut or all six of the guys solved this great problem in the standard electroweak theory by coming up with their mechanism. And that is, I mean, they did something great. They gave us a great tool. But that's totally wrong because there was no electroweak theory, and so there couldn't be a problem in it for them to solve. But they gave the solution to problems, two problems that would arise, the problems of gauge boson masses and fermion masses. So here's what we have in the case of a spontaneously broken gauge theory. This object that used to be the the uh, rotational mode or the phase mode now gets swallowed by the gauge boson and becomes its third longitudinal component. And what used to be the radial or amplitude mode is left over as a spin zero particle, which we now call the Higgs boson. So lots of people contributed to this. And over the years, um, you know, various people are throwing elbows for credit and others are throwing elbows to not get credit and so on. I first met Peter Higgs in 1984 at a meeting on 50 years of the weak interaction. And um, so I was invited as the child. And I went to this meeting partly because when I looked at the list of participants, I thought they were all dead. So I figured this would be my last chance to see them. And I have to say, most of them were really terrible people because they were still fighting priority battles from the 1930s that, uh, let's say generously, I didn't understand why they were important. But Higgs was very, very modest. Um, he was one of the two very modest elder people there. And so he wrote down that these Higgs fields are the scalar fields that uh, many people had talked about, Gelman, Levy, Schwinger, Schwinger uh, Anderson, and so on. Uh, what does seem to be unique, and in the papers is unique, is that Higgs is the one who emphasized this leftover massive scalar particle. And perhaps that's why he has some priority in, his, uh, in the naming of the object. So does this save the Yang-Mills theory? Well, the answer is no, because after spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's still not the right theory of nuclear forces. However, it's a very useful invention uh, if we take the same theory, same construction, but apply it not to SU2 isospin symmetry, but to SU3 color symmetry among the quarks, it's the basis, unbroken, of our theory of quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of the strong interactions. So in its, in its, uh, the basic idea was right, but the choice of isospin or flavor symmetry was not the one that turns out to be useful. Well, there's one more element that we need before we discuss uh, the real electroweak theory, and that is the notion that parity is violated in the weak interactions. Uh, this came up as a proposal during the 1960s to account for some funny behavior of um, certain meson decays. A key experiment was done in 1956 by Wu and Ambler. It's uh, wonderfully simple in the way they did it. Uh, they took polarized cobalt-60, which is something that beta decays, so electrons come out of it. If there were no correlation between the spin axis and the electron, the direction of the electron, preferred direction of the electron, then you could turn it upside down, and whether you looked at it in a mirror or not, the distributions would be the same. Whereas, if there's a preferred direction, either along or opposite to the direction of spin of the cobalt-60, you would see an effect, and that indeed is what they did. So what you see here on the right is uh, their data. What they did was to cool, to polarize and cool a sample of cobalt-60, align it either up or down in a magnetic field, they had no provision for keeping the sample cool while they studied it, and so it would warm up and the degree of polarization would go down. And what you see in one orientation is, whoop, one orientation is a deficit of counts compared to the unpolarized sample, more counts in the other orientation, and then as the sample cools, 
it goes to the state in which there is no preferred spin axis. And so this shows directly that there's a correlation an unobservable that becomes observable between the spin direction of the cobalt 60 and the preferred direction of the electron emission. And that is showing the parity is violated in these, these decays. So this leads us to the notion that there is a difference between the left-handed and right-handed constituents. And in today's language, we see that as a difference between the left-handed and right-handed uh, quarks and leptons. These are spin a half particles, so they have Two components, but they're like two hands. They're related to each other, but they're not identical. And what we see from beta decay experiments and others is that for the left-handed particles, because parity the weak interaction turned out to be left-handed, the charge current interactions only affect the left-handed particles, not the right-handed particles. So that makes these little doublets between up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom. The color symmetry is present in the same way for both the left-handed and right-handed pieces. Similarly, for the leptons, only the, the left-handed ones have been seen to interact so far, not the right-handed ones, with respect to the charge current weak interactions. So that's our basis. And the electroweak theory now can be, used, can be derived. We don't have a derivation of this from first principles. And so what was necessary was for people to make guesses about what the right symmetry might be if you could make a symmetry-based theory of the weak and electromagnetic interactions. And the one that proves to be correct is one based on a weak isospin suggested by this, uh, these families connected by the charge current weak interaction. So an SU2 symmetry and a phase symmetry like the one that gives us quantum electrodynamics, but a little different. It's related to a quantum number called hypercharge. And these have to be hidden from us in some way so that we get down to the theory that we see. This is worked out first in, in detail by uh, Shelley Glashow. It gives you three massless gauge bosons that are coupled to the weak isospin, a fourth massless gauge boson coupled to weak hypercharge. No photon, only a hyperphoton, and the quarks and leptons have to be massless. So it's a step on the road, but not the end of the line. The next step was taken by Weinberg and Salam, who, following the work of Higgs and company, realized that you could take a theory based on a gauge symmetry, make up a vacuum state that would hide the electroweak symmetry for which you need four fields. And by doing this, you could arrive at a theory that had gave masses to the carriers of the charge current weak interaction, the mediators of beta decay and muon decay and such things. A consequence of this was that you had a, another gauge boson that nobody had observed called the Z and a massless photon, so that was good. And then there was one leftover degree of freedom which is the massive Higgs boson of the standard electroweak theory, the object that our colleagues have now discovered. So, you know, it's a nice story to say, well, there's the symmetry and it leads to lots of nice properties, but it's hidden from us. But it's good to see if there's a way in which we can test that symmetry and actually see that it's there. And in some very nice experiments at CERN, at the LEP accelerator, it's been possible to do that. You annihilate an electron and positron to make the two carriers of the charge current weak interactions, W plus and W minus. There are three mechanisms that lead to that. One is neutrino exchange. The other is a formation of a virtual photon and finally a formation of a virtual Z. Any one of these diagrams by itself gives an unacceptable high energy behavior. All the pieces uh, grow uh, unbounded with energy. So you would violate probability conservation as well as reason, if that were the case. They involve couplings of the gauge bosons to fermions, both there, one there, one there, and gauge bosons among, among themselves. So they're relating different kinds of interactions to each other. And when you make the calculation, if you have only neutrino exchange, you get this unacceptable behavior. You add in the photon, you get this. And when you add them all together, you get this nice benign behavior which at least makes sense and doesn't violate probability conservation. So it's the co cooperation. This is one of these calculations that makes you believe in the power of symmetry. Even better, when you make the measurements, you find that it's in, the measurements are in excellent agreement with the calculation that you make this way. So although it's a hidden symmetry, we can say that we validated the symmetry directly in experiments. In experiments leading to the creation of the Large Hadron Collider, we were able to detect through quantum corrections 
the effect of the Higgs couplings to the W and Z in the vacuum. These told us, so here's a measure of the badness of fit, if you like, if, uh, of quantum corrections to a whole host of observables. The best value is first at a finite mass of the Higgs boson, telling us that a Higgs boson is, dis is desired. And it's a little under 100 GeV. So in the range in which we found it, at which the best fits were found. So there, following the procedure of Higgs and others, it was possible to make calculations of the mass of the W and Z bosons. We've uh, made experiments in the early 1980s in which those particles were found. They're found with the masses that you expect in the electroweak theory. They're actually definite predictions. Weinberg and Salam also noticed, and so enforced by decree, that it was possible to write down interactions not dictated by the gauge symmetry, but consistent with the gauge symmetry that gave masses to the quarks and leptons in the theory, and coming from the interaction between the fermions and the scalars. So that's sort of neat, but frustrating, because nothing fixes the values nor relates them to each other. So one of our questions is whether that will turn out to be true. It's for this reason that there's no calculation in the theory that allows us to say anything definite about the fermion masses other than the fact that they exist, that I like to insist that the problem of quark and lepton mass corresponds to physics beyond the standard model. There's something in addition that we need to learn about what sets the values of these masses, and they range by a factor of 300,000. Okay, so there's this Higgs field, the scalar field. It's giving mass to the gauge bosons in a well-defined way and in a less well-defined way to the fermions. People, you know, it's a natural human desire to want to find a, a classical explanation for this, and so people often say, the Higgs field is like molasses. I would like to protest that it's not like molasses. Viscosity re resists motion, but what we're talking about with mass is resistance to acceleration. So alas, or maybe to its glory, this phenomenon of mass acquisition is a fundamentally quantum mechanical uh, phenomenon, and I don't know of any classical explanation for it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk in the last minutes about uh, the implications of the discoveries. Let me just take a word to anticipate why this matters. You know, it's uh, one thing to say, particle physicists have been looking desperately for the Higgs boson for the past 30 years, but you might say, what do they know? Why, does it, why should anyone else care? So I set myself the problem a couple of years ago, having put my trust in my experimental colleagues that they would find this object or whatever takes its place, I thought, what am I going to tell my mother? And so I thought that the right way to think about what I would tell my mother, who is 94 and still going strong, great inspirational figure, uh, is to, to figure out what the world would have been like without the Higgs mechanism. And you know, in the usual hubris that gets you started on a theoretical problem, that's simpler than this world, and so it must be simpler to work out. And so it only took 18 months to work out what things would be like, but I'll give you the quick summary. Uh, without something like the Higgs mechanism, the electrons and quarks would have no mass, so that's a basic difference with our world. Quantum chromodynamics, quantum chromodynamics doesn't care whether the quarks have a little mass, as they do in our world, or no mass. It still confines them into things like protons and neutrons. So we'd basically have protons and neutrons with their masses not so much changed. Now, there's a little surprise that at the same time that QCD is confining the quarks into protons and neutrons, there's also a phenomenon called the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. This brings together the left-handed and right-handed quarks, and because they transform differently under the gauge symmetry of the electroweak theory, that actually breaks the electroweak symmetry. So QCD by itself is enough to break the electroweak symmetry, but it does so in a way that's governed by the lifetime of the pion, and if you work it out, it leads to masses for the gauge bosons that are a factor of 2,500 too small to, count, to account for our world. So it's a nice template for a possible theory, but it's not the real one. So we've got these things that maybe would make nuclei in the early universe, whatever the early universe is like. Um, you could ask whether you could form atoms. Well, if the electron has zero mass, then the Bohr radius of a protoatom is infinite. You can't associate an electron with a specific nucleus, and so you can't have the exchange of electrons to make valence bonding, so no chemistry, 
no stable composite structures, no liquid solids, no human beings, uh, not very good. So very different. Well, as you know, and you've heard from your colleagues here who participated in the Atlas experiment, uh, after heroic effort, we have succeeded in making a uh, lovely device in Geneva, a Large Hadron Collider, with the energy and the frequency of collisions that uh, it takes to make a, uh, conduct a search for the uh, Higgs boson. Uh, our colleagues in the Atlas experiments and CMS experiments have done that, and uh, they built their wonderful detectors. All they had to do was wait. And as they wait, here is the two-photon decay, uh, rare decay of the Higgs boson, but one that it's possible to uh, discover. And you see bumps come and go, but there's one that grows and persists as you accumulate more and more statistics, and that is the uh, signal, one of the signals for the Higgs boson in ATLAS. Uh, here for equal time for my Fermi, Fermilab colleagues who work on CMS is the accumulation of the four lepton signal. So this is Higgs decaying into ZZ, HZ decaying into a pair of, uh, of leptons. And these people cheat by showing you what the signal should look like all the time. Uh, but when you're finished, the signal and the data really do look the same. So that's another independent observation. We now have a number of these independent observations. So all of this left, led to the uh, glorious day of the 4th of July in 2012, in which the uh, discovery was announced uh, in several channels by Atlas and CMS. Here we see the spokespersons of Atlas and CMS and the Director General of CERN. And I think the most remarkable thing about this picture is that you have an entire auditorium of people at CERN not looking at their laptops, but actually looking at the seminar. Um, so I was, uh, I watched this at Fermilab starting at uh, 2.30 in the morning or something like that, and it was uh, really a moving event after many years of waiting to see that this would happen. We didn't know that it would turn out this way. We knew there was an agent of electroweak symmetry breaking. We knew that it behaved with respect to the couplings to the W and Z more or less the way it should. But whether it was going to be an elementary particle or a composite particle or some combination of things, we didn't know. And we're now well on the way to answering some of those questions. So I want to end with a list of questions. We've gotten to the point where we are directed in a certain way. Our colleagues have found this object that is the avatar of electroweak symmetry breaking. Uh, the Higgs field is, is the agent that hides the electroweak symmetry, at least dominantly. We still need to know whether it fully accounts for electroweak symmetry breaking or whether it's only one of the contributors. It looks like it is certainly a major contributor. Uh, we want to know whether in addition to coupling to the gauge bosons, which really was uh, intrinsic to the theory, it also couples to and gives masses to the fermions, the quarks and leptons. And in that respect, there's been an important development in the last week from both ATLAS and CMS. Uh, ATLAS has given a shown a 4.1 standard deviation signal for Higgs decaying into tau pairs, the heaviest of the leptons. Uh, and CMS has shown um, three sigma or something like that for the tau pairs and a similar signal for B quarks. So not quite at the level of discovery yet, although if you put them all together, you, you wouldn't bet against these things coupling to the fermions. So that's a very important bifurcation because theoretically we could have imagined a division of labor, one mechanism giving, hiding the electroweak symmetry and giving masses to the, fermi to the gauge bosons and something else coming in and giving masses to the quarks. So it looks like we're on that track. Whether quantitatively it accounts for the fermion masses and if it does, where they come from, what sets the numbers, we don't know. We still want to know whether there are other Higgs-like objects and both experiments are looking for that. Quantum numbers of the, the object are important. In the standard model, it should have spin zero, parity positive. Uh, we now know to very good approximation from both Atlas and CMS and a, a, a series of rather clever um, analyses that it is dominantly a spin zero plus object. So that's as the theory told us. We need more data to find out whether it's really accounting for the branching fractions, the gauge bosons in the way we expect. Maybe it gives us a window onto new particles that we hadn't discovered before in the decays, so they're working on that. Uh, are all the production modes as expected? One of the nice things about the mass at which it turns out, 
125, 126 GV is that you have enough rate now and more in the future to study five, six, seven different decay modes of it. And that will give us a real characterization of it. And also three or four, maybe five production mechanisms. So we can really diagnose the, the object in this way. Um, theorists are taken with the question of, OK, we now know that the object exists. That's very important. But we also know that it has a specific mass. Mass isn't predicted in the theory. Can we think of the implications of it being at that mass? Does it mean that there must be new physics nearby or far away, or that we live in a metastable universe and we don't have to pay our bills or what? So there's lots of speculations along those lines. We have not seen any analog of the BCS theory of superconductivity. You might have thought that's a more fundamental theory of superconductivity than Ginsburg-Landau. Maybe that would be the template for the breaking of electroweak symmetry. But so far, this object is behaving as if it really were an elementary particle, the analog of the order parameter in the Ginsburg-Landau theory, rather than of a correlated pair in the BCS theory. So lots of questions, and I'll now take your questions. Are there any questions for the speaker? Ian. What would it take to throw out Landau-Ginsburg theory toward a BCS explanation? Well, if we saw, so the question was, what would it take to, to go away from the parallel with the, the Ginsburg-Landau theory? Uh, had we seen, had the object turned out to be a uh, pseudoscalar rather than a scalar, that would have suggested that it was a bound state of two objects. Uh, had we seen some evidence for new strong dynamics that would come from strongish interactions, uh, we would have seen that. Uh, the question is still open uh, because we've only bar barely begun to look at this. But um, if things persist as they are, it's a very interesting condition because we've never seen an elementary scalar particle before. And they have certain, there are certain elements of uh, the field theories of, of scalar particles that give us a little disease in the stomach. Um, but it's a problem here rather than here, I think. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether this persists or whether we'll find that there really is internal structure to them. You might, if we saw a recurrence some distance away, uh, that might, depending on the, the properties of it, suggest that dynamics are at play rather than just one elementary object. And um, so we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, what else to say? Enough for now. I, I should say, had it been dominantly the other way, a, uh, a composite object, it's possible but not very graceful in such theories to arrange that the couplings to the W bosons and the Z bosons are as strong and in, in the same proportion as they are in the elementary theory. So that, would have, that was an opportunity for the elementary interpretation to fail in a way that it hasn't yet. Now, if it turns out to be elementary, then it may be very illuminating for us because there are other places in theory, inflationary universe, uh, quintessence models of uh, the accelerated expansion of the universe that rely on elementary scalars. And so you might hope that we will learn something from this one that will make us smarter in approaching those problems, but not by direct measurements. Uh, in biology, one often thinks of the concept of natural selection or survival of the fittest. So you could think of a snapshot at any given time of those organisms, their masses relate to how they interact with each other and the fittest or what is there. One could be tempted to think in physics of, you know, can you reduce that to something like conservation of, of energy? or so, but I'm thinking instead in the opposite direction, that if you take the universe and all the masses and particles and so on in the universe at a given time, 
could you think on that level of some type of natural selection? In other words, the masses that are observed are somehow the fittest, whatever that means. So it's, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> Let me try to give a small answer to it. Um, in our experience, so this is a preliminary, in our experience, the laws of nature and the values of the, couple, of the elementary constants, so coupling constants and masses, are the same at all times and all places. In our experience, so we haven't experienced everything that's possible and there could be variations that we haven't seen yet. Um, so you know, that's one sort of behavior that you might have had of things, things evolving over time. Still possible, there are people who worry about that both experimentally and theoretically. Uh, there is a persistent recurring line of thought that says that um, you know, this funny pattern of masses we have going from the electron mass up to the top quark mass, a factor of 300,000, uh, you shouldn't worry about it. I mean, the, so the tendency is to think those numbers must mean something. There must be some pattern. All, all I have to do is learn what's behind it and I'll be you know, illuminated in new ways. So there's a line of thought that says, well, those are just numbers and it happened that way. And we're biased because we're living in a universe in which we are here and evolved to ask the questions. And only in certain universes could that have happened. And maybe there are millions, billions, jillions of universes in which there are different values of these things. And so you shouldn't worry about that problem. And um, so that's, that's a selection uh, ar argument about uh, the world in which we live. We don't know the answers to these things. Uh, you know, there's a, a famous example of uh, long ago. Mr. Kepler, who gave us the three laws of motion, was uh, intent on finding out why the ex six planets that he knew about lived in exactly the six circular orbits that he thought he knew about. And today we say, well, that's not a question. You know, that just happens. Uh, what's important is the laws of nature behind it. We don't know whether, whether this particular set of uh, particles that we have, values for the particles, values for the couplings, uh, even the forces themselves are just consequences of environment. Uh, you know, that only in, a, in such an environment, or at least in such an environment, we could, we could be here to ask the question. Um, so we don't know what's forced and what's, what's not. And that is a question that we can partly try to address scientifically, and partly it's a little dreamy for now. Um, so I, I believe it's interesting to pursue the masses and uh, mixings of the quarks and leptons in hopes of finding something out. But, uh, you know, and, and if we're misguided like Kepler, I hope we'll at least find three laws on the way. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, I have a question. At, at some point you mentioned rightly that uh, if you didn't have the Higgs, still uh, there are these uh, quark condensates that will break the symmetry anyway, will give tiny masses to the... So is there any obvious consequence of the existence of these two independent uh, contributions to the symmetry breaking of the electroweak interactions, because uh, you have the two still surviving in nature, right? right? The Higgs and the, the one proceeding from QCD. So it's, it's a good question. That, you know, I was looking at the possibility that QCD was an alternative to the Higgs mechanism. Carlos rightly points out that we appear to live in a world in which there is a Higgs mechanism, but there is also a strong interaction. So it's actually related to the mechanism by which the pion decays. There is a mixing between the, the two things in just the right way that, that things work out. All the way in the back, good. Um, given the discoveries they've been making at the LHC, and even the ones you just talked about, coupling to the, the B and the tau, um, as those discoveries have progressed, do you see a compelling case for building uh, the lepton Higgs factory, so like the ILC, now or 10 years from now, waiting to see what the LHC finds? So that's a very good question. The question is uh, whether we should be building a complementary in instrument to study the, uh, the Higgs boson. Um, so first thing I would say is, if such a machine existed today, no cost, no delay, I believe a third of the people now working on Atlas and CMS would rush across the street to get a second look. Uh, so obviously it would be valued, valuable to get a second look. 
Um, if I were making decisions for the universe, I would um, wait to see what comes next at the LHC. We'll have nearly double the energy. Uh, very quickly, we hope to have a similar amount of, uh, a similar number of collisions. And I would not myself want to embark on uh, such a program without knowing that if I did that, I wouldn't be locking myself out of doing something, maybe even with an electron positron instrument, that was more telling. So if, if, if not next week, but in three years, they announced to us that there's a second object like this, a 320 GV, you would feel vexed if you had built a machine that was only capable of seeing this one. Uh, you know, obviously the people who have been working on this device for many years wish it had started years ago. It's a very expensive undertaking, so I think we have to be quite careful about uh, deciding whether it's the right thing to do, whether we can make it happen on the right time scale. Part of me says, uh, I hope this isn't the most burning question for my grandchildren. And uh, you know, look, lamentably, these things take a long time. But there are things that you could do, uh, either with a low energy or even more with a high energy electron machine that are complementary to the view that you get at the LHC. Anyway, I, I would, as a physicist and taxpayer, hold off for a little while before deciding which way to jump. There are other ideas. That, I mean, the, the best developed one is the International Linear Collider, which uh, maybe our Japanese colleagues will want to launch soon. We have to follow those developments. There are other ideas if you just wanted to build a Higgs factory and knew that that was the only target in which you could make a circular machine that probably is better for the purpose, but more limited in what it could do. Uh, I think those machines are less expensive, but they're still very expensive. So, you know, we're taxpayers too. We have to be sane about these things. Uh, and to, to weigh the opportunities against the cost and the opportunity cost of doing such a thing. We're very lucky to have one instrument that's giving us a lot of information now. So actually, I had a question. I, I think you said that the theories didn't predict the mass or the energy of the Higgs. Is that correct? Right. So does it give boundaries? I mean, was it just luck that, that uh, CERN found this thing? I mean, what's the story there? So. Um, the theory doesn't allow you to calculate the Higgs boson mass, but there's a simple calculation that you can do. Uh, since thought experiments are easier than real experiments, you could say, uh, what would happen if we collided two W bosons with each other? And you follow that through, and you find uh, an another one of these miraculous cancellations among different contributions that gives you, in the limit of very high energies, uh, constant value of the partial wave amplitude. So that's good, it's not growing beyond bounds. And you, it's really wonderful to do that calculation because you see just how the gauge invariance works. It turns out that the value of that partial wave amplitude is set by the square of the Higgs boson mass. And so if it were too big, you would have a partial wave amplitude that violated probability conservation. It's a tipping point rather than an absolute bound because if you were above this bound, you know nature isn't going to let probability not be conserved. You'd have strong interactions and stuff. But that tipping point comes at, um, at the expression is that the Higgs boson mass squared has to be less than um, 8 pi root 2 over 3 times the Fermi constant, which is numerically almost exactly equal to 1 TeV. And so we have known for a long time that on the TeV scale, we would either find the the mark of electroweak symmetry breaking, or we'd find some other new physics that might have been multiple production of Ws and Zs or some, some sign of uh, new strongly, uh, strongly interacting weak interactions. So we've, we've been very confident since uh, 1977 that we knew that the TeV scale was magic. Now you can argue, is it 700 GeV? Is it 1.2 TeV? But that if you went to that place with uh, sufficient rate of collisions, you would get the answers. The, um, late lamented SSC was conceived to make a very thorough exploration of, of all that uh, terrain. And the LHC within the limitations of the LEP tunnel was also contrived to make a thorough exploration. There it's a smaller machine, there were one or two really annoying exceptions, but basically it was built to be able to carry out this, this search. And it really was a search for the mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking 
not just a search for the Higgs boson. That was the shorthand that we used and that you know, people now think that's all the machine was for. It was never just for that. But we did know where to go and, and what to do. And the contrast with some of the other speculations that we have about what interesting physics there might be is that in, uh, in many cases, we are pretty well convinced that there must be new physics there, but we don't have a similar argument for where exactly the physics must be or where you have to explore before you know that it's not this but something else. It's getting a little late. Well, one more question. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Fermi, uh, Fermi uh, Tevatron at some point has some hint uh, um, before you know the shutdown and uh, LHC started. There's some hint uh, about uh, Higgs. Is that uh, consistent? Uh, consistent with you know the. I missed the first half. Can you say it again slowly? At Fermi Lab at Tevatron, you know, there's some. I remember there's some result report. Uh, you know, there's some hint of uh, Higgs. Yes. Uh, is that consistent with the? Uh, it is. So, so Fermi, the Fermi Lab experiment, CDF and D zero, did pretty heroic work looking for the Higgs boson, we probably needed a factor of two more data, or maybe a factor of three more data to really be in the hunt uh, for where it turned out to be. If the Higgs boson had weighed, say, 160 GeV, it would have been found at the Tevatron. And in fact, the Tevatron pretty early was able to exclude the existence of a Higgs boson in that mass range. The two experiments also have pretty suggestive hints of extra events in the range uh, that are consistent with Higgs boson being produced and decaying into BB bar pairs. Uh, what's unset, so it's three sigma or so, good hint. What's unsatisfying about those, especially to the people <laughs> involved, is that it's not possible to localize that very precisely at a particular mass. So the disturbance that they see, the excess that they see, is just what you would expect if there were 126 GeV object decaying into BB bar the way the Higgs boson is supposed to. So it, it, adds, to the, it adds to what we know. It, it aligns with what we know from the LHC. But it's insufficient by itself to say, I really nailed it. I guess you would agree, Larry? OK, well, let's thank our speaker for a very, thank you very interesting much. talk.